C4C Divers. Welcome to Facebook Live. It is Tuesday. It is March 22nd of 2022. And we have Dr. Larry Wood here for our guest presenter tonight. Everyone say hi to Larry. Hi, Larry. Yay. Okay. And you guys, uh, you know the drill if you've been coming to our Facebook Lives. You're going to go ahead and give us that thumbs up emoji, that smiley face, or that heart emoji to let us know that you're enjoying tonight's presentation and that uh, you like the topic. So make sure you hit those emojis for me. Also, if you come to our Facebook Lives, you know that we like to reward you for signing up online. So that way we can give you some kind of a, a prize. So we do a raffle at the end. So make sure you go to www.force-e.com, go to the event tab and look up the tonight's event and register before 6.45. I'm going to be pulling the names off of that registration and we'll be doing a random name picker and we'll be giving out uh, a raffle item. And that raffle item is actually a big blue dive light. That's right, guys. Uh, we got a nice donation from Big Blue. So I'm going to tell you what that is. If you can see my phone, there it is. It's the AL1300 Big Blue light to raffle off tonight. And yes, I don't have the light on me right now because you probably don't see the background. It doesn't look that familiar, but I'm actually in California, everybody. So I went home to visit some family for my daughter's spring break. So I'm in California. So right now I am actually looking at the, the, the ocean, but it's not the Atlantic. That's the Pacific Ocean behind me. And I saw divers getting in and doing a shore dive here in La Jolla today. And they said the visibility was about 15 foot. And they had Garibaldi's and they had... Um, seaweed and kelp beds all over them so it was a very nice dive and I did not join them because it's like I don't know 50 degrees <laughs> I don't know what the water temp but it's, it's 59 my mom says and it was a little on the chilly side for this Floridian because uh now I'm used to my warm water so <laughs> all right but thanks you guys for joining us and uh like I said go ahead and register before 6 45 so you get in on that um raffle and you guys know that March, we always do Sea Turtle Month. So when we do Sea Turtle Month, we always have to include our favorite sea turtle researcher, Dr. Larry Wood. So Larry, you've got a great presentation for us tonight. We're going to be talking, he's going to be talking about the um, history of our sea turtles and the state of our sea turtles um, here in South Florida, because, uh, you know, back in the day, when there wasn't as many people doing research on them, who were some of those pioneers and what were some of the regulations and laws? And he's going to talk to you about that and then what they've done throughout history to protect these animals in our beautiful state of Florida. So Dr. Larry Wood, are you ready? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? I hope. Yes, we can. You got it? Okay. Sounds good then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start your presentation. All right. Well, thanks, Nicole. Um, I don't like that cold water either, uh, water either, so I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, if you don't know me, I'm Larry Wood. I'm with the National Save the Sea Turtle Foundation, uh, which is an organization based in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, the foundation has been around for 25 years now. And uh, the idea behind the foundation is to raise money through various means and use those dollars to support research, conservation, and educational programs around the state of Florida uh, and a little bit beyond, but nonetheless focused in the state of Florida uh, to um, promote all different kinds of aspects of sea turtle conservation. And uh, one of those uh, Nicole is quite well aware of, and that's the project that I run, uh, which is related to the Hawksbill turtles, which many divers around here uh, know well. Uh, so I now for, gosh, almost 15 years have been uh, studying the Hawksbill turtles here that are around the state of Florida. So. Uh, my career here in the state of Florida with the turtles is now going on uh, 30 or so years. So I guess I'm kind of privileged to be one of the earlier people, I guess, or the, 
not certainly the earliest, but one of the, the, the second generation, I guess, of sea turtle people that came in and started to do some of the uh, groundwork around the state. So when Nicole and I were talking about what we might talk about tonight, um, I thought we'd kind of do something different since people may or may not realize that there's a, a long history of sea turtles and people here in Florida. I'm sorry about that glare that's coming through my window there. Um, uh, throughout the state of Florida now for many, many years. And so uh, it's kind of a review. It, it, it's hard to do that in a short period of time. So <laughs> it's just going to be kind of a, the tip of the iceberg review, but it's kind of the best I could do in a short period of time uh, to give you kind of a history of what's gone on uh, here in Florida with the sea turtles over the years. So, uh, Nicole, I, I'm going to switch to the next slide here on mine. Uh, so if you could do that for me there, that would be great. So when you say history, uh, I thought I'd go do some deep history here for you guys. Um, I am no geologist, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's kind of interesting to know that, sea, uh, that Florida itself has had an extremely long history. Uh, if you go way back millions and hundreds of millions of years, uh, in the upper left-hand picture there, you can see Florida was nestled in there, right there in that big old blob of land that was known as Pangaea. And then uh, a few hundred million years later, that large land mass began to break up. And uh, interesting how in the picture there, the one the middle upper picture, the arrow points to where Florida was, but it looks like it's not well attached to North America. Well, it's not also well attached to what would become Africa either. And as those continents started to drift apart, Florida ended up drifting westward along with South America and eventually ended up kind of joining up uh, with North America much, much later. So it's obviously a long, long history, but Florida itself started to take shape as the, we kind of think of it nowadays. Uh, somewhere between 65 and 35 million years or so ago. But lots goes on within smaller periods of time over that long period of time. And of course, glaciation and other massive changes occurred to the geology and geography of the Earth. And so Florida sort of slowly but surely formed as the Appalachians eroded and sent uh, a bunch of sediments southward, sort of formed the northern and central part of the state. And of course, being underwater most of the rest of the time, that carbonate platform that you see in those pictures there is largely created by marine organisms. You know, it's a corals and so on. So over time, Florida kind of got skinnier and got wider and then got skinnier and got wider and so on. But for the last 10,000 years or so, Florida has been relatively stable since the last ice age, which occurred about between 20 and about 12,000 years ago. Uh, Florida has kind of taken shape as to what we think of it now. So while all that was going on, sea turtles themselves were evolving. And uh, we, we think about sea turtles as being ancient things. Well, well, they are. But the ones that we see in today's oceans aren't the oldest ones by any stretch. So what we see today out there are what we call the modern sea turtles, the extant species. Uh, there's now eight of them, uh, or actually seven of them. Sorry about that. And so the um, sea turtles themselves go back geez, over 100 million years. But the ones we see today evolved, basically diverged from their ancestors right around 40 to 50 million years ago. And sure enough, that's about the time that Florida itself was becoming uh, suitable for their livelihood. So you can see that over long periods of time, as these sea turtles were evolving, Florida itself was evolving, and these two made a pretty good match uh, for themselves. Uh, I, I wanted to put a little note in the lower left hand uh, part of the slide there that you know we're talking about sea turtles tonight but uh, Florida itself is host uh, to uh, 30 plus species of turtles including freshwater turtles of course the gopher tortoise and sea turtles uh, that's 10 percent of the total number of uh, species of turtles in, in the whole world yet Florida is um, only a tiny fraction of the earth's land mass uh, so it's a surprisingly large concentration of turtle species in one small area uh, in the world. So uh, Florida itself is pretty famous uh, for its turtles. Uh, okay, Nicole, we'll go to the next one there. Well, along came uh, people right about that same time when I was talking about that ice age that happened uh, right around 20 to 10,000 years ago. Well, that, that created the land bridge 
that allowed people to migrate from Asia over through into what is now Alaska and down through North America and began to settle uh, Florida back around 10,000 years ago. So, of course, the turtles were here, and as you can imagine, indigenous people found the turtles a very useful source of uh, protein, uh, both through their eggs, of course, but uh, certainly the turtles' meat themselves. Uh, the shells were used for a variety of tools and, and cooking things, all different kinds of things. So there's a lot of things that the indigenous people uh, were able to get from the turtles. But that in itself uh, is a sustainable practice. Uh, and so they weren't really responsible for declines in the long term of, of sea turtle populations. Uh, but along came uh, the Europeans. And um, at first, sea turtles weren't of particular interest to the Europeans. Uh, they found that sea turtles were mostly used to feed all the people over here, the colonists and the slaves and the various things. It, it was not considered a particular delicacy. Uh, sea turtle is sort of uh, the meat of the, the common people. And so at some point, a uh, basically a good set of salesmen <laughs> started to uh, sell the idea that this uh, turtle soup uh, was pretty good stuff, and it caught on over in Europe among the elites, uh, especially in England. Uh, the, the Spanish weren't particularly interested. Uh, it turns out the French didn't like the turtle soup largely because the English did, and they didn't like anything each other did at the time, so they weren't very responsible for the take of the turtles, but the demand for uh, the turtle, basically the turtle soup, uh, grew tremendously in Europe, and so Fleets of fishers uh, would come over here to uh, the Caribbean, uh, Florida Bay, and all around, and uh, scoop up as many turtles uh, as they could and ship them off. Uh, there is a quick note uh, about the culinary aspect of turtle soup. We hear about turtle soup. It's really not the meat of the turtle that is the main ingredient of turtle soup. It's the um, something called calipé, and that's up in the upper right-hand screen. Uh, Calipé is a, uh, the term for a gelatinous fat that lines the inside of the belly of the turtle. And, uh, there, uh, and also the top shell, too. They're slightly different kinds. But nonetheless, this is a gelatinous fatty material that is used to make a broth. And the broth itself is what is the turtle soup. Uh, the soup itself, in, in many cases, had many other things in it besides turtle. Is really the broth that was the, uh, the particular thing that they wanted. Um, Hawksbills, as opposed to the green turtles, don't taste as good, uh, but they have that shell, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful carapace. Uh, each one of those plates on the back of the hawksbill shell can be removed and used uh, for any number of different artwork and other personal items, uh, inlays to, to find uh, cabinetry. And uh, it was interesting because at the time, uh, since people hadn't invented plastic yet, uh, it was hard to find a material that could be heated, melded, molded, layered, shaped, cut, and all that kind of stuff that would still then maintain uh, that shape after it was uh, cooled back down again. And so um, tortoiseshell uh, became very, very valuable uh, for all kinds of uh, expensive, again, uh, kind of high-end jewelry and other personal items. So uh, there was quite an export. Um, the reason I throw in turtle crawls here, since we're kind of bringing this around to Florida, is that uh, turtle crawls was the center of the sea turtle trade uh, here in the Caribbean uh, down in Key West. So it was the primary place that turtles were brought in from the region, either slaughtered, canned, or whatever, and then sent off to the various destinations that it was, uh, uh, that it was you know, they were purchasing. It. So there's still a museum down there in Key West called the Turtle Crawls Museum, but at the time, um, it was started by a gentleman out in New York back in 1895 and, and lasted about 20 years or so, but it was a, a huge, huge um, port for turtle meat and turtle products uh, through the Caribbean. And, and just to give you an idea of the sheer tons, this, this chart here in the lower left starts in 19, uh, eight, sorry, 1890, goes all the way through 1974, and on average, around 10,000 uh, kilos of turtle were taken each year, sometimes exceeding 100,000 uh, kilos. So this is just massive, massive numbers of turtles that were taken from the Caribbean, which was then responsible for the crash of the turtle population, which then was largely the end 
of that culinary fad that was known as turtle soup. Uh, it got too expensive uh, even for the elites and it largely lost favor uh, in culinary circles in the depression in particular in the 19, uh, 30s and 40s and so on and so as it turns out there was sort of a cultural shift and you just uh, the last of it really was down in tourist places in Key West in the 1950s and 60s and even into the 70s where they would sell turtle meat as a novelty in some of the restaurants but as it pertains to a, a wholesale culinary fad uh, that uh, kind of waned faded away uh, with the turtle population so you know sad to say <laughs> that was what did it but over time that also forced some relief to the populations since the product then wasn't sought after nearly as much anymore because people weren't making any money off it. So, oh, next slide, uh, Nicole. So, um, on top of that, <laughs> as long as we're kind of going through the troubles that sea turtles had, uh, we've put, placed upon them any number of other pressures here in the state of Florida, especially as the state has grown. Uh, Florida has uh, grown enormously since the invention of air conditioning and so people have flocked to the state and created uh, some hassles uh, for sea turtles uh, that were not related at all to people harming them. Uh, there was no particular connection between these, these things and the sea turtles and uh, one of the most important uh, over the years has been the uh, use of uh, trawling, uh, uh, what do you call them, you know, trawlers that have large nets behind their boats and these things are very effective at catching all kinds of things. Well, good for that, but the problem is they're also effective at catching the things that the fishermen don't really intend to catch. And this is called bycatch. And unfortunately, one of the bycatch that was becoming a big issue were sea turtles, because especially shrimp, shrimp trawlers were fishing in areas that sea turtles would frequent. And sea turtles, being air breathers, uh, would drown in these nets. And so. Uh, that was a major, major issue for a long time and, and remains so. Uh, in a little while, I'll get to some of the solutions to these problems, but to suffice it to say that things have gotten a heck of a lot better in that sense, but that was one of the major issues that we had with sea turtle conservation uh, here in the state um, after uh, the use of them for commercial purposes sort of waned away. Uh, of course, development of all kinds, whether it's the beach, uh, the water, the habitat that they like to nest on is one of the most valuable and popular habitats that people like to go to. So there is a direct interface between turtles' reproductive activities and economic interests uh, for the state of Florida, let alone any other place around the world where there are resorts and sea turtles all coming together into the same places. One of the big issues with coastal development is coastal lighting. Uh, this is why we had the turn the lights off for the sea turtles in the summer programs. Uh, very briefly, sea turtles are uh, sensitive to light as hatchlings when they leave the nest, and they use light to orient themselves to the ocean. Uh, before there were lights along the beach, typically the ocean was the brighter horizon between the choices of the dune landward direction, which is typically elevated, uh, and then your flat, open ocean horizon to one direction. So they're, they're kind of programmed to run away from uh, the tallest, darkest thing that they see, to run toward the lighter horizon, which is 99% of the time the ocean. But unfortunately, when we turn the lights on, uh, they get the wrong cue, and they notably go the wrong way at that point. And, and that has become a pretty big issue up and down, um, especially the east coast of Florida. But again, another problem that we've had to tackle and then, of course, there's good old-fashioned hab habitat degradation, which isn't good for anything, you know. We can talk about the problems that sea turtles have specifically, but they share the same problems that all the other organisms that share their habitats have. So the various sources of um, environmental disruption, pollution, whatever, I'm not going to rail on and on, but humans have enormous impacts on our environment. And, and when those go unchecked, there are some serious issues that occur to other organisms, but clearly also the sea turtles. So... Aside from the fact that we consume them for centuries, modern humans come in and we start to mess them up in a variety of other ways. So, a little good news for us. So, next uh, slide, Nicole. Given all these things, uh, there was an effort to come to the rescue. Uh, people are quite familiar uh, with the Endangered Species Act, uh, which was ratified in 1977 
but there was a precursor to that uh, called the Conservation Act um, that was um, uh, allowed for the protection of critically endangered species or species that were known uh, to be in critical uh, um, condition. And so uh, all three of the, the, the uh, hawksbills, leatherbacks, and ridleys ended up getting uh, U.S. federal protection in uh, 1970. So they were the first species uh, to get federal protection. Uh, later, uh, in 1978, uh, the loggerheads and the green turtles fell under the protection of the uh, actual Endangered Species Act, which was ratified again in 1977. So federal protections uh, now allowed for various um, uh, countermeasures, including the development of the of devices that reduce catch, other programs that enable the uh, reduction of various issues that we were just talking about. So the legislature in Florida decided to kind of back that up in 1991 uh, with the Marine Turtle Protection Act. And that was done to establish a Florida, like a sea turtle program at the Department of Natural Resources. So there were dedicated team and a dedicated set of people that were looking specifically at sea turtle issues in the state of Florida. So. That's, that's interesting because if you consider there's only seven, you know, species of sea turtles in the world, only five of them even come by Florida, only three of them nest here. So what is essentially three to five species of, of turtles are getting uh, quite a lot of dedication, love resources uh, through the state legislature. So that, that kind of starts to reflect uh, the overall interest and the overall popularity and public uh, interest in conserving sea turtles. Uh, that, that doesn't happen if these their constituents don't push for these things. So uh, it, it is kind of interesting to see how uh, people's uh, natural affinity to these animals enabled these laws to get enacted uh, fairly early on. Uh, I will briefly mention there's, there's people talk about the red listings with IUCN. Uh, there is such a thing. Uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature uh, is in fact an uh, international organization and what they do is they list species globally that are uh, in threat of extinction or uh, threat, there's various levels, but anyway, in trouble. <laughs> and so the all sea turtle species are listed on that. That does not have a regulatory uh, function. There is no, um, uh, they can't enforce laws and so on, but what they do is they provide guidance to people all around the world for uh, what animals should be involved in their various conservation plans and so on. So it has international meaning and certainly it's important, uh, but it is not something that uh, is, uh, provides the animals with, uh, with direct uh, laws. They're not related to international laws. There's another, which I didn't throw on here, but quickly I'll mention it, something called CITES, which is um, the uh, Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species. And that limits the trade of those species that are listed as endangered species internationally. So that's how regulation can occur internationally with the trade and trafficking of endangered species. Uh, okay, so Nicole, next one. So uh, I figured I'd kind of throw at you some of the people that really made a difference uh, kind of at the beginning here in Florida. Uh, there's a gentleman named Ross Witham, uh, who was DNR's uh, first uh, marine turtle coordinator. And he had that job from uh, the early 60s all the way through the late 80s. Uh, he is well known, among other things, he was quite a good scientist. But if there's anything in the turtles, I wanted to kind of mention what he did. Uh, he was the guy that came up with the Head Start uh, captive rearing program. He had the idea that since the green turtles were, were very endangered, that he would be able to uh, take hatchlings and raise them uh, to a size where they would be less vulnerable uh, to predators. You know, as we all know that uh, hatchlings, when they're leaving the beach, are, um, you know, tasty little treats for all different kinds of organisms, including fish. And so he thought, well, if we can get these things a little bigger before we release them, then their chances individually of surviving would be better. So the, that was his premise, and so uh, he set up this program where various facilities around the state 
uh, would raise uh, little sea turtles for about a year till they got to be about 10, 10 to 12 inches long or so across the, the top of their shells and then, and then they were released. And so the, the, the program was intended to be a long-term program because uh, green turtles can take 20 to 30 years uh, to mature. And so the idea was there were going to be X number of turtles that were to be raised and then there was going to be sort of this waiting period <laughs> to see what would happen. And so, uh, of course, nothing happened for a very long time. And uh, wouldn't you know, as fate would have it, uh, just as, the, as Ross um, was retiring and um, his health was ailing and everything, sure enough, believe it or not, uh, a couple of his turtles uh, showed back up uh, with tags on after all that period of time and ended up laying eggs on the beach. So uh, his, uh, his overall vision uh, certainly came, came true and... You know, whether or not that's the, the world's best conservation um, effort can be debated. But nonetheless, he was able to prove that it's possible uh, to raise turtles in captivity through that period of time uh, successfully. And uh, they not only came back and, you know, they remembered where to go. All the different questions that we have about whether that would work, <laughs> uh, he was able to, to at least give some of the first answers to. So that was really cool. Uh, and then a uh, fellow that around here, he, people never heard of, I'm sure, on the East Coast, but there's a gentleman named Charles LaBeouf uh, who started uh, the very first real uh, sea turtle uh, project on the beach anywhere on the state, really, and that was over in Sanibel. Uh, and so he, believe it or not, had the very first turtle permit. He's, he's <laughs> turtle permit number one, uh, which was issued uh, back in 1972. Uh, Charles is still around today and still involved in the Coretta Research Project. Uh, but, but he was a, a real pioneer on how you get people out there doing these nesting beach surveys in an organized manner with volunteers. But what we just think of is totally regular nowadays and very typical. Everybody goes out and everybody, all the volunteers and the researchers, you know, mark their calendars for March 1st and all this. It's, it's very, you know, uh, almost kind of run of the mill nowadays that that's what we do. Uh, at the time, that was not the case. And so he was a real pioneer to get people out there understanding how we can interpret what's going on with populations by very carefully following uh, the nesting trends. Uh, Frank Lund, I, I couldn't find a picture of the fella, so I, I'm sorry about that, but, but Frank, uh, he was an early on tagging guy. He, he wanted to see how turtles came back and forth in what we call the inter-nesting period. And so we know that nowadays that turtles nest more than once uh, throughout the course of each season. And so what he wanted to do was put tags on their flippers up in Jupiter Island and uh, continue to monitor the beach uh, to see how frequently they would come back, not only within seasons, but between seasons. So he was one of the first people to glimpse into this idea that the turtles remember have a particular range that they're nesting in. So he was able to find that... Um, the turtles would repeatedly nest within X, you know, distance of each other on Jupiter Island and then also through time. So he would wait over a couple of three years and sure enough, his tag turtles would come back again. So he was one that kind of started to get an idea of how the turtles nest multiple times in one year and then take a few years off before they come back. So, so that was kind of cool. Um, in the lower left, we have Doc Earhart. Uh, he unfortunately for us all just passed away a few weeks ago. Uh, but he was a pioneer of sea turtle nesting beaches on the East Coast. So he started back in 1973 up in the Archie Carr, uh, what is now the Archie Carr Refuge, uh, near Melbourne. And uh, he was started to do these extensive nesting surveys over long stretches of beach and uh, established that that is, in fact, one of the busiest nesting beaches uh, in the entire world uh, for loggerhead turtles. Um, we talk about uh, Jupiter and Juneau, Northern Palm Beach County being very busy with turtles, and, and they are, but uh, that stretch of beach up there rivals uh, our area here. So he was one of the first people to document the importance of that area to that species. Uh, but he also, at the same time, was one of the first people to do uh, in-water netting uh, up there at the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, there have been historically very large populations of sea turtles. So he and his students uh, with the uh, University of Central Florida uh, would go out and do netting programs and start to put tags and other basic research applications uh, to uh, these in-water populations. And so uh, very pioneering work uh, from both the beach and uh, the in-water uh, aspects of sea turtle biology. 
And then near and dear to my heart, of course, on the lower right is our Noreen Rouse. Uh, Noreen uh, was a famous diver. Uh, she was a, a co-founder of the scuba club at the Palm Beaches. Uh, she was one of the first female instructors to ever receive uh, that certification. And she took uh, an affinity to our turtles out there uh, as a diver. So all these other gentlemen were largely looking at turtles while they were on the land. Uh, she was looking at the turtles out there in the ocean. So she spent uh, over 20 years diving twice a day, uh, right around the Palm Beach area and usually the same places repeatedly. And over that period of time, got to know the comings and the goings of the resident sea turtles very, very well. Uh, she had them named. Uh, some of the loggerheads would return annually, almost like clockwork, uh, to the same places, stay for about the same period of time each year and disappear again. Uh, so she was one of the first to document the migratory behavior of the male turtles. She was one of the first to document the home range uh, and what we call the site fidelity or, or the amount of time that turtles spend in one place uh, through all the hawksbills that she was encountering. Uh, again, she named them. <laughs> uh, she measured them. She, uh, should I say this, she fed them on occasion, so on and so forth. But the point was is that she was collecting information uh, that no one else was able to collect at the time. And uh, she, however, as opposed to these other gentlemen, uh, she was not a, a real scientist. She was more of a naturalist. And so her work never ended up in scientific publications and so on. But she did report her findings at various meetings and uh, other modes of communication at the time. Um, so she certainly did spread the word, but, but her work was largely overlooked uh, by the scientific community, uh, which is sort of a shame because she did have a tremendous amount of information. So um, briefly, I've put together sort of a compiled a, uh, the summary of her, her observations and I'm slowly putting that together into a, a manuscript. So when that's done, I'll, I'll make sure everybody uh, gets, gets some of it. It's a, a fascinating uh, story over about 20 years of uh, diving here in, in Palm Beach. Uh, okay, so Nicole, next slide. Uh, how often it is we complain about the government uh, not doing anything, <laughs> so I get that, but at times uh, it does work, and so these are some gentlemen I wanted to do a, a quick shout out to uh, that, that weren't specifically Florida, but nonetheless deserve a shout out, because if you don't have the federal government uh, involved, uh, th there's a, a lot of the state stuff lacks teeth, you know, you, you kind of have to have a a, com a partnership between federal and state agencies to really get anything done. And, and these gentlemen uh, were, were true workers. These people wanted things for the sea turtles. They wanted to see change. Uh, so uh, Jack Woody, unfortunately, has passed away. Uh, he is, uh, was a pioneer of, uh, he was kind of the he, it was the, he was like the first coordinator that the federal government had specifically for sea turtles. And again, you can see how that elevates what is a relatively few species of animal <laughs> to that importance. That's, that's pretty amazing. So he was assigned that very first job. Uh, sort of following him up was Earl Possart. Uh, and um, he was critical in starting, uh, it, it kind of getting that Archie Carr refuge uh, together up in Melbourne, which is now, again, one of the most important nesting beaches in the world. Uh, and also what we now use as the basic methodologies by which we do statewide nesting counts, uh, uh, which was um, obviously clearly important before the state really had that program going. Uh, then there's the guys that were saving the turtles offshore uh, from all of the uh, various fishing uh, uh, problems. And so Chuck Orvets and Larry Ogren uh, were key to enacting the uh, protections, and I'll get to it a little bit, but there's trawling what are called turtle excluder devices uh, that were used uh, to protect the sea turtles from the nets. So um, just a quick shout out to those guys. Um, unfortunately, all except Earl have, have passed on, <laughs> but uh, these were pioneers uh, of the time. And so we're very thankful for, for what they did. Uh, so uh, next slide, uh, Nicole. So what they started uh, was this sort of wave of conservation efforts uh, that many of time came up just organically. Uh, so it's one thing to have laws and legislation, but that doesn't really translate often that well to the general public. 
Uh, so the idea behind all these other efforts is to how can we improve the sea turtles' chances of survival while they happen to be here in our waters, you know? And so clearly some of the issues that they've had over the years uh, have been, no, not always successfully, but they have been addressed. <laughs> and so it's not like people aren't, t you know, trying to address some of the problems that sea turtles have. And so just a quick few of them, certainly the beach has been a major issue. As I mentioned before, it's a direct interface between everything tourism and everything sea turtle. And so uh, everything from seawalls to beach renourishments to dredgings to everything else have been applied to beaches to try to keep beaches suitable for the people. Uh, sea turtles can benefit from that given that the choice of material is done carefully and the placement of sand is done carefully. Uh, though it costs millions and millions of dollars more to do, beach renourishments can only happen during the non-nesting turtle season nowadays. So it's costing a lot more money to do this stuff in the wintertime but nonetheless, because of the turtles, uh, they're not renourishing beaches during the nesting season. Uh, beachfront management, now, all those lights that caused the baby turtles to go went the wrong way have spurred this huge effort along the coastline to change out the way buildings are lit along the coastline. Sea turtles are much less susceptible to distraction from different wavelengths of light. I'm not going to get into the vision of the turtles, but suffice it to say that a switch from a white light to a yellow light makes a big difference. And suddenly sea turtles aren't scrambling across highways and through patios and pools and everything as they're going the wrong way. So it kind of benefits everybody. Uh, predator control uh, used to be, back in the 40s and 50s, that uh, bears would take most of the sea turtle nests off the beach <laughs> in many parts of the state, but bears aren't around anymore. Uh, and so different predators have had chances to get into nests. So most of the predation that occurs to turtle nests around the state is due to small mammals, uh, raccoons, foxes, uh, skunks, uh, opossums, all things like that. Uh, and so programs around the state have minimized the natural predation to the point where we're really producing a whole lot more turtles per nest than would otherwise be produced. So given that somewhere around 90% of the nests that were laid on the beach 100 years ago were getting eaten by something, currently the rates of predation in the state of Florida are less than 10%, and in many places less than 5%. So through human intervention, we've managed to increase the relative productivity of these nests. That's all the more hatchlings hitting the water, which is clearly all the more that are continued through their life cycle. So uh, that's been a huge thing. Of course, rehabilitation. Um, now there are over 20, gosh, I think it's 26 facilities around the state of Florida who have specialized hospital care facilities uh, for sick turtles. Uh, they get everything from MRIs to transfusions to laser therapies, uh, things that I would hope to get if I ever got sick uh, are applied to, to these animals. So there is a, you know, not every animal gets saved, but you know, half of them <laughs> uh, that come into rehab, uh, given that they don't have something that is you know, obviously too debilitating, uh, go through a process and they get themselves back out into the ocean. And it's not many, but some of those have been seen a nesting on beaches subsequently to, to that. So you, you know that you're helping some of them and they are going to continue to add to the, to the population. Uh, just a quick note on pioneers. Uh, that gentleman uh, there with the loggerhead turtle there looking at it, uh, that's Richie Moretti, who was the founder of the Turtle Hospital down in uh, Marathon uh, in the Middle Keys. Uh, he was starting his turtle hospital about when I was starting the turtle hospital uh, in Juneau Beach. So he and I were sort of, uh, sort of contemporaries uh, in discovering all what we could do for these animals. Uh, that that uh, facility is still going well down there. Uh, he's still alive and well and still active and involved. Uh, but yeah, he, he had a very interesting perspective he had. Uh, he, he came in and he, he was a professional mechanic uh, who decided to invest uh, in a motel and a uh, motel had a saltwater pool uh, and he used to keep fish and uh, all that sort of thing, sorry about that, in it. And um, 
he decided that he wanted to have sea turtles in it one time. And, and uh, so he asked the state, you know, how he could get sea turtles. And they said, well, you know, you really can't. They're protected. And he goes, well, there's got to be a way. And they said, well, if you, you know, I guess if you take in the sick ones. So he actually started the turtle hospital based on an interest uh, in allowing his guests at his motel <laughs> to see the turtles. Uh, but he became very impassioned with it uh, and used to say, well, if I can fix Volkswagens, I can fix turtles. And so uh, he ended up becoming uh, one of the most successful and uh, pioneering of uh, our people here in the state. Um, uh, quickly, on the lower right, I was mentioning before about the nets. Uh, there are now devices that are placed in fishing trawlers uh, that enable uh, turtles and other larger organisms to escape from trawlers. And so it kind of works for everybody. The fishermen are still catching the intended catch and at the same time allowing a lot of the bycatch to uh, to escape. So that's that, you know, it's not easy to enact and there's all kind of arguments about it and such and so forth. But over time, uh, it's become much more accepted and is now the norm uh, rather than the exception in the in the shrimping industry. And then, of course, good old fashioned education, you know, um, can't do this without that. Public education is huge. And the more people that learn about sea turtles, the more people that like them. And these are the more people that are going to go out and, and use their voice uh, to protect them, whether that be at a legislative level or volunteering someplace or whatever. Uh, this is how we get people involved. So I uh, can't go without a shout out to all the great education programs around the state. Uh, okay, Nicole, next one. So uh, how do we measure uh, how we've done? Uh, the best way for us to measure is by looking at the nesting uh, effort, we call it, that each of these species is making over time. Because as scientists, we can't go out and count the turtles individually, we use a different measure or a proxy for how their population is doing by looking at nesting effort over time. So in, in theory, the number of nests that are placed over time are representative of the overall population. Now there's a bunch of caveats in that and we know that, but if you think about it overall, over long periods of time, this is a subset of the population, and if that subset grows, one might infer that the population is growing. If that subset uh, shrinks, then you could infer that the population is, is shrinking. So it, it's a long-term thing. But guess what? A lot of years has gone by <laughs> since we started doing this. So uh, back in 1989, uh, a very standardized methodology was applied to counting sea turtle nests across the entire state. And so as teams went out there to collect these data, they were doing so in a very standardized manner that could be compared from place to place. So you could compare information from East Coast to West Coast to the Northeast Coast, wherever. So these graphs here are showing how the nesting population, this is not the entire population of, of turtles, this is the nesting population, has managed to do over the last, uh, uh, what, about 30 years or so. And so our loggerheads up on the upper left, they got their good years and the bad years, but if you look at it overall, there's what you would probably call, inferring from this, a fairly stable population of Atlantic loggerhead turtles. Again, ups and downs over that long period of time, but no particular shift in the overall population. You're looking at your green turtles over here on the right in Florida, and they, much differently, have gone from just scant nesting back in the 80s, uh, since basically the year 2000, have shown what we call an exponential increase in nesting activity. So uh, we infer from that that the green turtle population is in fact growing and I didn't bother to get some new charts. This stops in 2015 and here we are in 2021, last, last season was 21, and that, that trend has continued. So the green turtle populations here in Florida are expanding uh, quite rapidly uh, on, a, on an exponential basis. And then we have our leatherbacks. I'd like to quickly note on the lower left chart, those are in the hundreds, not the thousands, like they are with the other species. So the numbers are lower, but nonetheless, they're representative. And so we have a Florida population that since, uh, again, kind of around 2000, uh, has started to show a fairly significant increase. So we'd like to think uh, that the leatherback population that is using Florida for nesting has generally increased over that period of time. Uh, there are some caveats here. The leatherback thing isn't as telling 
because we don't believe that there was a, a population prior to this that is recovering. We believe this to be more of a founder population or a new population. With the loggerheads and greens, uh, these are ancient populations. So uh, we are seeing a true recovery of green turtles uh, in the state of Florida. They, they probably were nesting at these numbers prior to all the hassles I was telling you about uh, with um, sending their meat off to Europe. Uh, so this is probably a direct result, if I could simplify things down to saying, that here we are about 50 or so years after we stopped wholesale slaughtering these animals and sending them off to Europe, and sure enough, we are seeing their recovery. So if one stops eating these animals, we will likely see their recovery. So that, that's good to know. Uh, so, okay, so next, what are we going to do? What are our problems? What are we going to deal with? Problems are not over, and some of them are unexpected. So, uh, briefly, some of you have heard about fibropapilloma. Uh, this is a disease that is likely of viral origin that affects mostly green turtles, and it causes a uh, uh, external and sometimes internal, but visibly external tumors. Uh, to grow on their uh, skin and eyes. Uh, that a big blue thing underneath the turtle's flipper is in fact a, that's a tumor, uh, about the size of a baseball. Uh, I just got that turtle a couple weeks ago out of the Jupiter uh, inlet area. Uh, so this is a disease that has been around a long time. Uh, it is, afflicts, uh, generally speaking, the same proportion of turtles. Uh, around the world. It's, it's spread around the world. I can go on and on about it, but it is something that is, is not of great concern to the overall health of sea turtle, of green turtle populations, but it's something that we have to think about and deal with uh, as it pertains to how we deal with these with rehabilitation and other efforts to help them. Um, some of you may know or recall from the sea turtle biology books uh, that the gender of the hatchling turtles is related to the temperature at which the eggs are incubated. So warming temperatures on beaches mean all the more female uh, turtles. And so one of the concerns that we have with gradually increasing temperatures here in Florida is what we call the feminization of the population. So uh, there are researchers, in particular Jeanette Wynikin at FAU, uh, who is uh, very closely studying this uh, through studying temperature changes and then the resulting gender of hatchlings. Uh, in her studies, where she's, she retrieves thousands of turtles, there, there were a few years, forgot which ones, but over the last few years where no uh, males were produced uh, that she could find uh, anywhere <laughs> in the state of Florida. So uh, interesting what that uh, consequences that may have. Um, but then I, I'd like to... Oh, and then coastal erosion, real quick, that kind of goes along also with uh, sea water rise, which goes along with that temperature thing. Uh, so how we manage beaches down the road in the face of uh, encroaching uh, sea high tide lines uh, toward all of our precious buildings and condos and so on, uh, that may, uh, of course, present a whole bunch of new problems in the next few decades. Uh, but then, at the same time, uh, with all the problems that we've thrown at these turtles, uh, that chart that I showed you with the green turtle nesting populations is reflected in the number of green turtles that are recruiting or coming back to our coastline as juveniles. So the cycle of the turtle is that the hatchlings leave the beach and they spend some time out in the open ocean. But when they're done with that phase, they come back to the coastline and they seek out uh, a new livelihood. And uh, green turtles in particular are uh, seagrass grazers, primarily, algae and seagrass, but they're known for their uh, role in overall ecosystem health related to seagrasses. Well, there are problems that are cropping up, believe it or not, uh, not with having too few turtles, but with having too many. And I, I, I present this to you guys as a little bit different. Uh, some of you may not have thought about this, but we actually have to worry to some degree, or not worry, but we have to prepare for <laughs> uh, the possibility that we've got too many uh, green turtles around for us to, to manage in the way that we're used to managing them. And so we may need to make some shifts in, in how we understand the dynamics of this animal and, and what we do 
uh, to protect them because there are concerns not only that increasing populations of green turtles are going to overcompete with what are declining seagrass beds, directly compete with manatees, uh, and also continue to take seagrasses to the point where they're not producing the bottom of the food chain. So as an example in Bermuda, uh, they've got real pop uh, population issues with green turtles because they're literally uh, grazing their seagrass beds uh, down to nothing. So the other organisms that rely on the seagrass beds uh, to reproduce uh, all the way up through the food chain are getting seriously affected. So uh, there are experiments now on how to fence off places from the turtles <laughs> uh, just to allow some of the seagrass bed, bed uh, habitats to grow. So uh, not, not saying it's, it's this impending, oh my God, but it's something to think about is that these animals are coming back and they're consuming things. And then you think about, well, we want to help all these animals, right? So they wash up on the beach and they're sick and you want to send them off to the turtle hospital, right? Well, what's the limit? You know, when are all the beds going to be full, you know, at the turtle hospital? And I can tell you today, we are at the point where that animal that you see in the upper left-hand corner of that slide did not qualify to go to rehab. Uh, that animal was otherwise in good body condition, regardless of the size of that tumor. So that was not an individual uh, that made it off to rehab. Uh, so we have to start becoming very careful on how it is we decide which of these animals are going to get all that help and which are. We could, in theory, become overwhelmed. This picture in the lower right uh, is uh, turtles that were, came up as a result of cold water. That was a cold water uh, event. So it's called uh, cold stunning. And uh, that was just one of dozens and dozens of rooms uh, in various places that were filled with these. Those are all green turtles. And so we do what we can for them, but what if that doubles, what if that triples, and so on down the road. So just food for thought that uh, as much as we love these animals, uh, there also can be limits. In fact, uh, some of you may be aware that green turtles have already been downlisted from uh, endangered to threatened. Uh, here in uh, this segment of their, their range. So uh, things are already moving in that direction, but uh, there are certainly uh, issues uh, potentially uh, down the road. So I guess I will uh, quiet down now here. I don't know how I've gone probably too long, but anyway, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that you guys may have, and I very much appreciate uh, you listening to this evening. Hey, can you hear me, Larry? Yep. All right. Thank you. What a fantastic presentation. Oh, my gosh. I learned some things that I had no clue. I thought I knew a lot about sea turtles, but um, the history of, of them and, and the protections and how everything was placed, it's just so fascinating to see how much, uh, you know, the differences have been made to protect them. So thank you so much. And um, do you have a few questions? Um, so... When, uh, you know, for the future, you're talking about, uh, you, they usually put out these FWC meetings to, you know, make sure that uh, these animals are protected. How, how much is the, the public voice being heard um, when it comes to these animals? That makes sense. You're saying related to, well, you you know, you're speaking, I mean, recently think about like the Goliath grouper, you know, situation. Right. That, that's one that's recent. But no, sea turtles have always been a uh, forefront. I, I, I can tell you that the, uh, the Palm Beach County Commission knows that you don't walk into that place to ask for anything that's going to mess with the turtles. I mean, they know that the lobby here, especially in Palm Beach County, but now even more so throughout the state of Florida is, is huge, you know. Well, I mean, and I so, guess the question kind of... You know, there's a there's a loss in um, habitat, but especially in what their food consumption, especially green turtles with the, you know, green green turtle grass, so the seagrass beds. So when it comes to pushing maybe some marine protected areas in the state, so that we can make sure that they have the food source, um, how how hard is that to, you know, push for to help these creatures? Uh, <laughs> how hard is that to push for? I, yeah, I, I, uh, you you got me on that one. I uh, I'm not I'm not sure how I answer that that question exactly. Uh, um, I don't, let me word it differently. I kind of so, see what I, I get where you're going, but how what do I 
what do I know? I you you have to there grassroots organizations. I would give an example. Uh, one that does very well is the Sea Turtle Conservancy, mm -hmm. and they're based up in Gainesville. and And their specific role and charter is to go into the legislature in Gainesville and be proactive uh, for sea turtles on all different levels, whether it's beaches, in water, whatever. So, there, you you know, how politicians respond, you know, yeah. is based on what kind of information they're getting and and what kind of you know grassroots like you said grassroots efforts are involved so if people want to save the sea turtles they're gonna uh, but people have to get involved you know what yeah. i mean so you know yeah they're you know, like what i guess what i was comparing it to is like with the dive groupers and you go to these meetings and it's like it's either the divers or the people who love you know the fish versus like the fishermen and it's like if sometimes it feels like it's loaded on the fisherman side and how much does that, you know, weigh in when it comes to protection? And so, you know, if you have fishermen who don't want you to close off an area because they want to fish in it, but you know that it's being used and it's in the, the grass isn't thriving there, if you gave it a little bit of protection, could that potentially come back? I know it's a lengthy question. Well, yes. well I, yeah, the, the only thing I would make, you know, <laughs> call me naive. But I believe that the decisions are made based on whatever research is done. Yeah. You know, they're not going to delist the grouper without doing research on what the grouper population is. They're not going to close off a seagrass bed without doing the research on that ahead of time. So whether we trust that or not, I know there are debates about that, but that's kind of what the scientists are trying to do. And what they do is they help guide those decisions. They can't make the decisions. They provide the information. And that's how these different things are addressed. So, yes, there's the popular effort, there's the groundswell of save this, but there's also the science that's kind of guiding whether we like green turtles or not, there's a heck of a lot of them. And the rules say that if these repeat, you can't keep an animal legally endangered if it's not. There are criteria that scientists have to list each of these species. And if they don't meet the criteria of endangered, they get downlisted. If yeah. they don't meet the criteria of threatened, they're going to get downlisted to species of special concern. Those aren't arbitrary whether I like sea turtles or not. Those are based on studies that are done uh, by scientists. So there's, there's obviously a mix of those things that, that all have to happen. Yes. Um, okay. So um, we do know that you are part of the, um, the Florida Hawksbill Research project. Uh, I've actually been out and worked with you um, gathering that information. And uh, how long have you been doing that project for? I'd started in 2004. Excellent. So that's uh, a while, I yep. guess. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating, guys. So just to let you know, if you want to learn more about the Florida Hawksville project, um, when COVID first hit, it was around, you know, the middle of March in 2020, and we did the first ever 4C Facebook Live. We actually did you and I in your backyard because we didn't have the, I didn't know this about this technology of like the you know, Zoom sharing and whatever, thing like that. So we literally streamed it from your backyard, and it was the first one we ever did. So if you guys want uh, to take a look at that one, go to our YouTube channel. And you can click on our Facebook Live um, presentations, and it'll be the first one that's right there. So if you're interested in learning more about the Florida Hawksbill research and what Larry does there and the uh, information he's collected from over the years, that is a great resource um, to find out about it. And 4C has always been a big supporter of the Florida Hawksbill project. Um, for example, uh, if you guys go to our website, um, during sea turtle month, I'm going to go ahead and hide this, bring this into stream. There we go. There is our website. I'm going to solo it here so we can check it out. So um, lots of great information here about sea turtles, but I wanted to note if you are spending $100 or more on our website buying stuff, we're going to be donating to the sea turtle rescue and research. So um, we're going to be giving that money to the Florida Hawksville project um, because we support what Larry's doing and everything that um, his organization um, 
you know, stands for. So there's lots of stuff on this page. It's really cool page that we created with sea turtle items, but it's any item that you buy online, not just anything sea turtle. So make sure you check that out. All right, let me follow that off. Okay. All right. And then um, a couple of things. Um, that's me. Um, Larry, you and I, we're, we've done in the past some of these turtle dives. Uh, right now, it's hard to do when it, the weather's been so crazy. So we're going to try and offer those soon again, you guys. So stay tuned. Uh, we're going to have some of those. But um, if you want to get involved in, and help, help sea turtles, uh, this Friday, March 25th, we're doing a paint night at our Boynton store. It's for the um, SOS cleanup um, lady. Her name is Lisa Micelli, and she's doing a, it's called Turtle Tracks, and it's the painting is of the Florida state with a little sea turtle, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you guys want to join us for that, go to www.force-e.com, go to the events page and sign up for our paint night this Friday. And another quick thing about um, events, uh, you guys know that with COVID, we couldn't do some of our fun ones. So one of the ones we're going to be bringing back is Bowling for Turtles. And again, we're going to have the donation set to help Coral Hawksville Turtles. So guys, stay tuned. We're going to be announcing that date tomorrow because I just have to finalize some stuff. And uh, we'll hopefully uh, see you at that event because it's always a lot of fun. Um, and you guys know that it's this time to do our random name picker. We need to raffle off uh, who our raffle winner is. So let me grab the name, random name picker. Here we go. Okay. Bring into the stream. There it is. Okay. So I said we were going to be raffling off a big blue light. Thank you, big blue, for the donation. So that is going to go to... Da -da 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 there we go. Sarah Nichols. Sarah, if you're watching, please make sure to give us a big thumbs up and a woohoo. I won. You won a big blue light. So you can pick that up at one of the four store locations. Uh, we'll be emailing you that information. And you know what, guys? I'm feeling generous. So let's go ahead and do another random name picker. And I'm going to raffle off a spot to Friday's paint night. So let's go ahead and see who that winner is. Who wants to go to paint night? Let's see. Robert, Robert, if you're watching, woohoo! Okay, so that is uh, our raffle. And guys, oh, Sarah, she said, yay! Thanks for watching. All right, and I'm gonna leave you with a question, Larry. They wanna know, who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I, I don't know. I'm going to have to pick Leonardo, I guess. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank you, Dr. Larry Wood, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you all for tuning in, and we appreciate the support. And we hope that you get out there and dive with some sea turtles soon. So, guys, let's grab our gear, and let's go diving. See ya.